2021 was another turbulent year for movies. Great films found their way out from artists both established and new, familiar and unsung, from the mainstream to the struggling edges of our modern avant-garde, as studios seem to make a move away from their momentary alliance with streaming, and theaters made a shaky comeback after the shutdowns of 2020. The industry began to visibly recover towards the end of the year, but with our present realities proving so ever-changing, our future remains as uncertain as ever. Perhaps as a direct result of this uncertainty, there was a surprising and significant thread of concerns expressed in many of the best films released last year, the widening discrepancy between our perceptions and our reality. Director Sean Baker in his film Red Rocket examined how a narcissist constructs elaborate fantasies in order to blame his misfortunes on external circumstances. Jane Campion deconstructed the western genre and the masculine image in her film The Power of the Dog, revealing how male posturing can work as a mask for secret fears and vulnerabilities. These are both films that explore the difference between internal and external truths, between the fictions we create and the realities we live. Asghar Farhadi, in his masterpiece A Hero, took these ideas in his own direction, showing us how fiction influences our everyday lives. The poor man at the center of his film goes from being celebrated as a hero to being condemned as a villain within the span of only a few days, the complications of his private life clashing irrevocably with the simplicity of a public narrative that has formed around him. Farhadi makes it clear that real people are not divided into such easy categories, and it is only because we insist on applying the mechanics of narrative to reality that we leap to such misguided conclusions, distancing ourselves from the truth. Even Lana Wachowski, in her widely misunderstood sequel, The Matrix Resurrections, worked to pull apart this same relationship, through many layers of metafictional commentary, questioning the ways audiences digest mass entertainment, she tries to make clear her own role as storyteller, the presence behind the scenes controlling what we see on screen. It's meant to make us realize that stories are personal expressions, not objective truths, and that we as viewers are prone to misinterpreting those stories by distorting them through our own desires and biases. These were all great films in different ways, and there were many more last year that were great for other reasons, but one film stood out to me not only as a remarkable achievement on its own, in terms of personal aesthetic and artistry, but also as the most powerful expression of this recent trend exploring the meaning of truth and the ways human beings hide from it. Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. Stanton Carlyle, played by Bradley Cooper, is a man with secrets, a past he is desperate to escape. When he falls in with a traveling carnival, he discovers a chance to remake himself. He gets a job, he meets a girl, and best of all, nobody asks questions, nobody intrudes on the shadows of the past. He befriends a once famous mentalist team, Xena and Pete, played by Tony Collette and David Strathairn, respectively, and learns of their old act. Pete invented a system for reading people that is so effective it almost appears supernatural. Pete teaches him the system, and despite numerous warnings of the dangers of its misuse, Stanton becomes infatuated by the possibilities. He moves to the city and remakes himself again. With Xena in Pete's act and his girlfriend Molly, played by Rooney Mara in tow, he finds fame and fortune and discovers even more available for the taking. Stanton's mentalist tricks escalate into an elaborate con game, attracting the attention of a dangerous 
and powerful group of people, including Dr. Lilith Ritter, played by Kate Blanchett, an intelligent and calculating psychologist, and Ezra Grindle, played by Richard Jenkins, a reclusive and guilt-ridden industrialist. Stanton believes his task is a simple one, give everyone what they want, and reap the rewards. He does not learn, until it is too late, that the consequences for toying so irresponsibly with people's lives are severe and permanent. Nightmare Alley, on the surface, is a curious anomaly. Del Toro has resurrected a genre not seen in pure form in ages. This is not a postmodern deconstruction. This isn't a neo-noir with a contemporary setting. It is a straight, classical film noir. Not even Del Toro's trademark monsters and love of fantasy intrude on this space. Why such an unusual choice? To begin with, Del Toro's ambitions go way beyond any kind of shallow genre exercise. Whether dealing with fantasy, horror, or noir, worlds that may seem removed from our own through their use of style, his mind is always on the present, and his comments always directed at the world we all inhabit. The way to those themes is through the style. Del Toro is a filmmaker for whom style and theme are intimately connected. His gorgeous images present a wealth of much deeper meaning through an intricate use of symbol and metaphor. This comes in part from Del Toro's love and appreciation for the symbolist painters of the late 19th century, Marcel Schwab, Felician Rops, Odilon Redden. Del Toro says it was the symbolists who taught him that a surface can be made of symbols, and that those symbols can convey a variety of inner meanings through their arrangement by the artist. Nightmare Alley, a use of the shadowy and deceptive world of noir as a means of exploring the meaning of truth and lies, may be the greatest rendering of these theories in cinematic form he has yet accomplished. There is much to appreciate in pure aesthetic terms. His camera drifts and glides with musical grace. His blocking of actors takes on the precision of a dance. There are sequences here that, simply in terms of acting, writing, and directing, are among Del Toro's finest achievements. Look, for example, at the mesmerizing scene where Dr. Ritter probes with silken ease into the cowering and shielded depths of Stanton's psyche. Notice the subtle movement of the camera, the extended quiet that descends across the soundtrack, the feeling of dreamy somnolence created by the deliberate motions and delicate, controlled tones used by Blanchette. Notice how this causes the layers of affectation to steadily fall away from Cooper's performance. Stanton, who up to this point has allowed no break in his facade, begins to reveal himself and betray his secrets. It's the last thing he wants to happen. He catches himself, but not in time to prevent a sliver of vulnerability, a glimpse of the shivering form of his true self from getting out. It's not just a flawless synchronization of performance and direction, it's a crucial storytelling moment that lets us know which of them is really in control, and it demonstrates how deeply Stanton is lying to himself. This is all precursor to an unforgettable final sequence where Stanton reaches the end of his rope and can no longer hide from who he is. Del Toro's is a moral universe, where choice and consequence weigh heavily. That moral structure is conveyed through symbolic motifs. In Nightmare Alley, the symbols are arranged around the ideas of blindness and illumination. Eyes serve as witness and judge to Stanton's sins. This is most visible through Enoch, the deformed baby in a jar first glimpsed in one of the carnival sideshows. Enoch appears at nearly every significant juncture in the film's first half, 
his single, all-seeing eye, tracking Stanton's choices and actions. The eye is echoed throughout the rest of the film in the production design's recurring use of circles. These eyes and circles all serve double meanings, the eye also being the film's key image for representing illumination, especially illumination of the self. Stanton is a spiritually blind man who believes he can see. He thinks he knows people because he can read their signals, tune in on the information useful to him. He thinks he knows himself, believing he can define who he is through the clothes he wears, the voice he uses, the words he speaks. He believes he can escape his past and his choices. What he doesn't realize is how thoroughly he is failing to perceive anything. He cannot see the actual people right in front of him. He speaks a few secrets, but he misjudges almost every single person in the film. He can gauge the surface, but he can't perceive the truth, not even about himself. Like the very people he is manipulating, he'd rather believe his own lies. Del Toro shows how a lie can be a powerful weapon and a valuable tool, dangerous because it can often appear so appealing, so soothing. Every person has some need deep inside that can be touched by the right lie. It can't be protected by money or status, and when someone targets that weak point, the consequences can be tremendous. Some characters in the film, like Xena, realize this. She knows there is a limit, that truth must take over before the lies go out of control and start to suppress reality. She makes her choices accordingly. Stanton does not. He does not see the harm in telling people what they want to hear, or telling himself what he wants to hear. He gains a little more, then goes a little further. As far as he's concerned, he's putting on a better show. At one point, Pete speaks to him of the traumas of childhood, saying that, in essence, if enough damage is done to us as children, we develop what he refers to as a hollow, an emptiness in our souls, a void we attempt to fill with anything and everything we can get our hands on. But no matter what we do, nothing will ever be enough to fill that hollow, which is why we must not feed it. Stanton has that hollow, another meaning behind the circles constantly surrounding him. It is the absence at his center, the missing piece he will never recover. It is why he does not perceive those limits honored by Xena why he does not grasp the importance of the grave warnings given by Pete and everyone else. Over and over again, Stanton is warned, discouraged, given ominous signs meant to open his eyes, and he chooses to ignore all of them. He blinds himself. He runs from the truth, pursued by dreams from the dark corners of his mind, lending the film an almost hallucinatory quality before, inevitably, he is cornered at a dead end of his own making and forced to see the light. He feeds the hollow until it consumes him. This is foreshadowed through another spectacular sequence, following Stanton through a demented funhouse called the House of Damnation. More eyes decorate the walls and gaze upon him, Mirrors and signs goad him. Take a look at yourself, sinner. And he does not. Waiting at the end of this path, among the bones of the dead, is another sideshow attraction. This one, the symbol of his own wretched soul. The final scene has an almost biblical impact. Stanton comes face to face with his own version of John 9.25. Once I was blind, but now, I see. Del Toro brings a profoundly dark and infinitely sad new meaning to those words. 
As a filmmaker, he has always been able to create remarkable sympathy for his monsters. Stanton Carlyle is one of his triumphs, a monster who tries to escape himself, who discovers how much evil he is capable of committing, and who learns to see himself with absolute clarity. What is most haunting about Stanton is how pitifully human he is. His actions are extreme, but the flaws motivating him, the mistakes that undo him, are not so unusual or unthinkable. All of us are potentially in need of someone to tell us a lie. All of us are capable of turning away from the truth in a defenseless moment. What makes that even scarier is the fact that the truth eventually has to shatter those illusions. But the more illusions there are, the harder it has to hit. That damage cannot always be repaired. What does it take to make a person accept the truth before it is too late? Del Toro is offering us a spiritual warning. Nightmare Alley is his ominous tarot card laying upon our table, a sign that we need to stop and look at ourselves. We need to take our own journey towards self-illumination before we reach the dead end of our alley.